Dr. Sonia Lanstein Candel, our special guest, Ms. Nabila Espanoli, honored guests, faculty, students, and friends. Welcome, welcome, ahlan wa sahlan, baruchim abayim, to the German Friends Association festive reception, coexistence, and empowerment. And warm welcome to our, our guests from abroad, especially the Lanstein family. 11 years ago, people gathered in a small university room to celebrate a new program. The Jewish-Arab Community Leadership Program gave young Jewish and Arab students the chance to learn together, to volunteer together, and to become leaders. Thanks to the German Friends Association and Dr. Lanstein Kandel, it is still succeeding. There are now other projects, the Werner Otto Scholarships, the Model UN, Haifa Meets Frankfurt, and more. Sonia's drive helped hundreds of students. Arab women found new confidence in their academic work, and other, others started to break down stereotypes and get to know each other as human beings without labels. To open, it's my honor to call on President Professor Ron Robin to come to say a few words. Good morning, everyone, especially Dr. Sonia Lanstein. Good morning to you. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here to this event that has become a yearly tradition at the Board of Governors meeting. It's special not only because it's a constant and it happens every year, it's also special because we are celebrating a program that celebrates the very fa fabric of this university. We've spoken a great deal over the past few years about the university and the transformations that are happening. Uh, but this, this event here underlines the purpose of this transformation to become the institution of higher learning with a significant presence throughout the region. Uh, with our portals, uh, we will bring together uh, many more students than we do at this particular time and point. And the variety of men, young men and women on our small, in our small country who deserve education, um, we'll be able to extend that far beyond where we are right now. Just two, two days ago, uh, Sonia, we awarded you a well and justly deserved honorary doctorate. Uh, and I'm so glad that you got it from first from the university that you love so much. Uh, Dr. Sonia Lanstein has been a staunch supporter and oftentimes an initiator of programs that aim to create dialogue between the students themselves, be they Jews and Arabs, and a dialogue, perhaps even more important, between the students and the communities, and their communities. This tireless effort has resulted in some of the most wonderful community projects that we have here at the university. Sonia, as you all know, is a champion of women's rights to access to quality education, and she has been nothing less than steadfast in her commitment to that. And today's event uh, is a testament to the fact this honor um, that we um, bestowed upon Sonia was not only well deserved, it was uh, one of the highlights of my very short career as president. Sonia, your name is a name that we're extremely proud of to add to our illustrious uh, list of honorary doctorates. And if I may ask the audience once more to thank Sonia. So today you'll hear a little bit about the programs. Um, uh, you'll also listen to a dialogue about the role that higher education plays in empowering women, a dialogue between our distinguished guests, uh, Ms. Nabila Spagnoli, and our own professor, Jenny Kuhlman, the Dean of Students. Uh, I personally believe, as I'm sure many of you know, that higher education is a catalyst not only for women, of course it is for women, but for all society. And I'm extremely proud that the university, with the help of passionate individuals like uh, the people sitting here in the front row, uh, and the German Friends Association is making this a reality. I wish to end my remarks 
few words to the students in the audience. This is a special time in your lives. You should seize this opportunity afforded to you by the university um, and earn the tools for leading a meaningful and productive life. This is a great opportunity and we're glad you're here and just seize it. In the future, hopefully, when your personal situation will allow it, you will remember this day and you will support other students like yourselves uh, to try and achieve those same goals that you're trying to achieve in your life right now. We all know there's no greater gift than giving. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Robin. As someone who's studying here, your words meant a lot to me. My name is Sosan Kher, and I'm a joint program PhD candidate at the Department of Psychology here and at Obo Academy University in Finland. I'm also a working psychologist. As a working mother, a Druze, and an academic, it was wonderful to be invited here. Women's empowerment is close to my heart, and so is coexistence. Part of my work is with the YARG, the Young Adults and Religion in a Global Perspective project. In 13 countries worldwide, we study the religious subjectivities and value profiles of students, young adults, and the role of faith in their lives. As a Druze, not many people know about my religion, so it's rewarding to bring the religious values of my community into this. Most of all, the study looks at the differences between people, yet, in the end, the research showed me how much we all share. So, that's an ideal point to introduce our keynote speaker. Her achievements are too many to list here. President of the German Friends Association, honorary doctorate recipient, winner of several high-profile awards, Dr. Sonia Lanstein, Lanstein Kandel devoted a lifetime to youth, education, and the future of Israel. She's a role model and an inspiration. It's my great honor to invite Sonia to the podium. Hello and good morning. I'm very grateful that this podium is low because a few days ago I was um, saying a few words in Jerusalem and nobody could see me, they could just hear me. <laughs> so I'm very, very excited uh, to be here, even though I've been coming for so many years. Um, dear Fred, chairman of the board and friend, dear Ron, president, um, and dear students, here, dear friends, I do need to thank the university and you, Fred and Ron, and everybody involved once more by telling you how happy and touched I am to receive the honorary doctorate from my university. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I say my university because I really feel at home at this beautiful campus at Mount Carmel with its multitude of cultures ethnicities and factions, Druze, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Bedouin, all that makes up the full picture of the Israeli mosaic. My university with inspiring staff, the academia, and above all of you students, you that are here today and others. For two decades I've been coming here and it always left me cheerful and motivated especially here at our event, when I meet you, as I did just before, our women uh, graduates, and our other many deserving scholarship recipients. I could not thank you, uh, think of a more beautiful place to receive such an honor than here, the values for which I fight and try to fight, indeed the good old values of enlightenment, the title, a little bit the title of my little speech today, The Future of the Past, Germany and Israel and the Values of Enlightenment. 
where they actually held high and practiced every day. Dear friends, these are difficult and probing times for our free societies. We all need to take a stand and we, if we want to keep them. Friends of Israel around the world are particularly challenged in many ways. Germany's relationship with Israel is of course a matter especially close to my heart. It is just a year and a half ago that we celebrated a number of important anniversaries, such as 70 years since the end of World War II and 50 years of diplomatic relations between Germany and Israel. Such milestones must naturally be used to remember. The Spanish poet Santayana once said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. This is correct, and the enormous responsibility of future generations in Germany for the Shoah will never cease. By the same token, it is also Germany's responsibility to Israel and to the world to make sure that our own society at home remains democratic, tolerant, and respectful to all that live in it irrespective of race, gender, or ethnicity. I'm also convinced that, as a Jew, I'm convinced that as time has passed, Germany has become quite a role model in terms of remembrance and soul searching. However, the challenge remains and will get even more visible. How can we embark on new paths of remembrance to reach the hearts of young people to whom all of this is mostly theoretical and a thing of the past century? Therefore, milestones like those I mentioned should also be used effectively to look forward, to take the future as a chance, and most of all, to create a clear point of view as well as an objective differentiation of issues. What does dedication to Israel mean under such circumstances? And most of all, how do we connect with each other apart from remembrance? In this respect, the situation has changed a lot. Solidarity with Israel only because of a guilty conscience for the crimes of the past does not suffice anymore. Israel is not a developing country anymore, quite to the contrary. Israel is perceived as, and indeed is, a cutting edge country. Or as we learned a new word, among others, yesterday at the presentations by the leadership, trailblazing. One of the highest life expectancies globally, the highest patent rate per capita, the strongest currency, the highest density of students, books and museums, and leading in IT, biomedicine, and security technology. Israel's cooperation with Germany has become a win-win situation in the fields of research, technology, and culture. But how far is the distance, how strong are possibly new boundaries between our two countries? Will these boundaries in future be harder to overcome, as for example the media suggests? And what then do we have in common other than the matter-of-factly issues I mentioned before? Now that remembrance fades, what is there for the future of the past? Politically over at home, Israel is heavily criticized, primarily for the settlement policy of the Israeli government and its lack of initiatives for a sustainable peace with Palestinians. This is the focus of attention at home. Of course, objective criticism of Israeli politics, as of any other politics, is legitimate, even in Germany, and I must say even desirable. But the fact that we have to point out this legitimacy, as far as Israel is concerned, all the time, in itself again suggests prejudice. Generalized and one-sided or vague bashing or singling the country out cannot be objective even when it likes to wrap itself in the cloak of a well-meaning friend. There are major and basic issues that are often forgotten and then in fact are at the bottom of what our countries have in common. Justifying and securing the strong bonds between Germany and Israel also on a moral, value-based level. 
Such values, which today we summarize under universal human rights, indeed go back to the age of enlightenment, when humankind started to, perceive, started to be perceived in its aspects of responsible beings based on reason and all the good that we associate with it, tolerance, freedom, respectful coexistence, in states that practice the rule of law, have strong civic societies and are vibrant democracies. I strongly believe that both our countries are, maybe I should say still are, on the forefront in this respect, even though the challenges have become bigger and deeper, even though each one of us has to work and contribute more in order to keep our democracies alive. And the challenge is, we need to embrace diversity as a chance, as a sine qua non of our societies, while at the same time be vigilant and uncompromising about the, those values of enlightenment and our free societies when and if they are attacked from within or from outside. Dear friends, when I try to talk about Israel to the German public and when I try to raise the awareness about it that goes beyond the 1.30 minute pictures in the media mostly connected to violence, then I talk primarily about two basics which should come naturally but are forgotten only too often back at home. Firstly, Israel is the only democratic state in the whole of the large Middle East with all the attributes of democracy as we know it. This includes the simple fact that it is you all the citizens of Israel who elect your government. This must be considered in all the scenarios when political pressure in any direction is applied from outside. We are not talking about an authoritarian regime. It is primarily you and your own responsibility what kind of government you get, as it is ours in Germany when we vote this coming September as it was in Austria, Netherlands, and France, where the people put right-wing and nationalist populists in their place. Secondly, hardly anyone in Germany knows that Israel has a multicultural and multi-religious population structure like anywhere, like, unlike anywhere else in the world. Hardly anyone in Germany actually knows that ne nearly one-fourth of the Israeli populations are Arab Israelis, that one-sixth of the population, the Russians, immigrated within only just a few years, and that you have freedom of religion guaranteed to all. It is this multiculturality that makes Israel unique. In fact, the Babylonian diversity that was in the past attributed to the Levant not only continues to exist in Israel, but nowhere else than in Israel, in this region. Formally and legally, uh, if I understand it correctly, everybody has the same rights. Women and men, religions and ethnic groups, homosexuals and heteros. In reality, I know discrimination against minority does occur here, as it does in other places, as it does in Germany, by the way. And also, Israel needs to fight this if it wants to live up to its own standards, still guided by its Declaration of Independence. Since independence, your state's foundation, your raison d'etat, has been based on the ideal of democracy and equal rights for all citizens. Numerous laws and decisions of your Supreme Court have confirmed and further developed this raison d'etat. I know of uh, some attempts by your government, also recently, to put in question one or the other of these principles, and this delicate balance between the Jewish and the democratic character of Israel. And I truly hope from the bottom of my heart that the civic society and the institutions in your country will be strong enough to prevent such attempts also in the future. As I said at the outset, I do also miss courageous initiatives by the Israeli government, of course taking into account all the necessary safety priorities, but initiatives to work toward ending occupation and finding a solution that would bring Israel security on one hand and at the same time 
stronger in line with the free world and with their friends in this world. Speaking of the defense of these equal values and ideas, it is also up to us back in Europe to work on it, now more than ever. Our canon of values can only be meaningful if each and every one of us fills it with new life beyond mere symbols. These values form the basis of a hopefully invigorated democratic and free Europe, our Occidental culture. And by the way, hopefully including a United Kingdom that embraces the same canon of values, even though it is tragically leaving the European Union. Tragically from my point of view. Today's discussion about preventing a default of Greece, about finance regulation, about the European failure of a common policy on refugees, the nationalistic tendencies in some of the European countries, all of this does not give enough attention and does not pay tribute to our culture's achievements and our freedom and peace in Europe since 70 years. Despite all differences, all of us are children and bearers of the Occidental culture. The blessing of enlightenment, the crimes of totalitarianism, the reality of Auschwitz, but also peace and freedom in Europe, all of this is part of our Occident. We cannot undo any of it, and we must not forget any of it. But none of it is irrevocable and finite. Democracy, too, is never complete, always need to be fought for. Dear friends, I want to be clear. I explicitly include Israel in this canon of values and in this fight. And it would be so wonderful for me to see Israel and Europe get closer again also in this very basic respect. For the past few minutes, I've been talking more about Europe than about Germany itself. This is because democratic Germany, without its full to a commitment to Europe, its embeddement in Europe and with its European partners, is just not imaginable anymore. Yes, it is the most populated country in Europe. Yes, it is the largest market the strongest economy, and may I say, it has the highest level of stability. But the raison d'etre is to be an integral and irrevocable part of Europe. In this, of course, and while safeguarding our own security and the aforementioned stability, we also have to fend off the rise of nationalistic populist and reoccurring xenophobia. But just as the impression of Israel that we get from, our, from media might be incomplete and one-sided. It might be that the image you get over here of Germany might also be only one part of the story. By this token, I think the diversity of Germany generally highly underestimated. About 20% of people living in Germany have a migrant background. It has also been an immigration country ever since the 60s, when the economy started picking up so rapidly. Germany experienced immigration waves of Turks, Italians, people from the Balkans, like me and my family from former Yugoslavia, and later from Russia and Eastern Europe, and of course from all the European Union, where we have complete freedom of movement of all people. Migration and cultural diversity have been among the key challenges that contemporary German society has to face. While it is widely recognized that Germany needs the continuous influx of migrants to address its looming demographic crisis, there is still some resistance against a modern, let us say, Canadian-style immigration law. In addition, the integration of newcomers into German society is not easy at all manifested most prominently, for example, in the still persistent underachievement of many migrants in the educational sector and the labor market. But also, especially lately, and I want to stress only with a very small minority of Muslim immigrants, with flares of radicalization and religious fundamentalism questioning the validity of the principles of our basic law. This, of course, cannot be tolerated. And the best way 
How to deal with this is a matter of a very heated political debate, which will continue practically throughout the electoral campaign until September and beyond. But debate, as we know from Israel, is part of the democratic culture and takes the wind out of the crude populist agendas. Last but definitely not the least, I want to, in, I want to stress one thing. The latest influx of refugees into Germany that you have all read and heard about was probably the most important challenge of our country since reunification. Only last year in, two, in 2016, we had over half a million official asylum seekers and in addition a few hundred thousand more of unregistered refugees, a great deal of them unaccompanied minors and young men. It would take at least another full-fledged speech just to give you a small taste of this huge issue, its problems, its many, many dramatic twists and turns, and its consequences. We can talk about it another time. Here, I just want to mention one final point. To help those refugees, and remember, Germany took in about one million so far, 10, 20, 30 times more than any other country in Europe, to help these refugees, we had about six million volunteers. Everybody from north to south, from east to west, in cities and in the province, day and night, in all fields, and it continues until today. The institutions and the system in Germany would have never been able to deal with this gigantic problem without the empathy and the hands-on help from the civic society. I must say, and someone who has much to criticize at home, this was a true German miracle, a triumph of humanism and of the canon of values so often quoted by me today. Those values that you all cherish too and demonstrate in all the wonderful projects we do together. And this brings me back here to the University of Haifa. Here we really can see the future of the past. I think this campus at our university is the world's largest meeting point for Jews and Arabs. I keep saying that, but I could not think of another one where it actually happens in such a concentrated fashion. We come here to study and discuss for a better future, our own and that of our society. Students here do not always do things together, but they practically always work side by side, mostly in peace. We, the German friends, are proud to be long-term partners and to contribute to meaningful academic programs of the university, which also reflect and, and foster our common values. We are proud of our Jewish and Arab community leaders who actually really work together. We are proud of our Arab-Israeli women graduates who by now branch out into all sectors of academia, business, and public service. We are proud of our multicultural Model United Nations teams that travel around the globe winning awards and being the ambassadors of what is the best at this university and the best of Israel. Peace can only come about if young people like you become committed leaders accepting each other's cultures and reducing and fighting prejudice. Again, as I said at the outset, despite all the problems we are facing nowadays, you are leaving me again very cheerful and motivated. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And warm congratulations on another wonderful achievement this week you received a prestigious honorary fellowship from the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Mazal Tov and Mabruk. <laughs> and now, for some music by students from the Department of Music. They will be singing Berkat HaMelech, or The Blessing of the King. Welcome on stage, Asael Weissman, guitar and vocals, Sagi Osi, vocals and keyboard, and Sally Kasabri, singer.
חלום בתוך האפר, כבת בכורה של עיר או פלא, וכמו חלום שאין לו פשר, כה נדירה ברכת המלך. Thank you. That was a wonderful performance. The dialogue today centers on higher education as a tool to empower women in the Arab sector. Unfortunately, member of Knesset Aida Tumasliman couldn't join us, but we're thrilled that Ms. Nabila Espanoli has tipped in. Ms. Espanoli founded the Nazareth Al Tufula Women's Center. She's a social worker and a psychologist. She, she campaigned for female and civil rights for over 30 years and in 2003 won the International Aachen Peace Prize. Professor Jenny Corman is Dean of Students and Professor at the Department of Psychology. She's an expert in cross-cultural psychology. 
Ms. Spagnoli, Professor Corman, it's my pleasure to invite you on stage. Working? Okay, thank you, Salson, very much. Uh, for, your, for those of you who don't know, Salson uh, studied our MA in the clinical education program in the psychology department, so I happen to know her for many years by now. And um, she is gaining uh, more and more visibility in the university, being a great role model for young Arab women here. So thank you, Salson, for being here. So hello everyone, and uh, thank you very much Nabila for joining, uh, joining us. I met Nabila in the beautiful Altafula Center for Children and was immediately impressed with her. Indeed, one of the advantages of being a dean is to get to know interesting people, so I really want to thank you, Nabila, for coming in such a short notice. I want to add an informative detail about myself, an important part of my identity as a faculty member is supervision of students. I've supervised over 100 theses, masters, and PhDs as I study culture and cross-cultural differences and cultural encounters. Many of my students were Arabs, mostly Arab women. Two of my students even got the Werner Auto Scholarship, so thank you very much, Sonia, and the Jewish Arab Center. Um, when I think about all the Arab women I've supervised, I can see a very heterogeneous group. They were of different religions, some were relatively modern and other more traditional. Some came from educated, well-to-do families and others were pioneers, the first to come to the university from their families. Some had to struggle more than others to finalize the empirical thesis, but they all did it and all took pride in it. The experience of Accompanying them through this journey opened me a window to the world, and I thank them all for that. We'll get to that later on, but now I want to go to Nabila here and really ask you to say whatever you want, and, but if you want to share with us your first encounter with the university, I'll be very thankful and happy. Yeah. Sabah uh, al-khair. Good morning. Guten uh, Morgen. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, actually, I was, uh, I was born in Nazareth in 1955 and uh, finished my high school in, uh, in Nazareth and I wanted to change the world and I thought that through social work I can change the world. And I wanted so much to, to study social work. I actually was a social worker before I began to study. I was uh, uh, practicing social work at, in Nazareth at that time, in 75, we didn't have that much graduation of social work, as you uh, may remember. Uh, but I wanted to uh, enter to social work, so I registered to Haifa University. And uh, my first uh, re relation, I was rejected by Haifa University at the beginning. And I received the letter home, and I began crying. And I'm number seven in a family of eight uh, sisters and two brothers, and my sister, uh, Dr. Hala Espanoli, she was already in the academia, and she uh, told me, if you cry, you will cry alone. Go and find why actually they're rejecting you. So I came to the uh, Haifa University, and I went from one office to the other, and I received three different answers for why rejecting me. And it was clear that the real answer doesn't, it's, not safe. So I uh, uh, continued to fight. I went to Professor Charlene at that time. He was the head of the Department of Social Work. And I'm so bad in names, but Professor Charlene's name remain. Some names remain in my history and my, my memory. And I asked him. I received this three different answers. One is I'm not intelligent enough, and I know I am. I, my Hebrew was not that good, 
that's maybe uh, a, a, a real um, uh, at that time. And my English, the third question, the uh, answer was that my English was not, not good. And I uh, graduated from a private high school, which English is a major. Uh, uh, so two, at least, I was clear that it's not, not the real answer. I was the, uh, I think that at that time, the one Arab more to be accepted at the, at the university. I fighted for my acceptance, and two weeks after the beginning of the studies, I received the place at the Haifa University. And I realized and I discovered that some of the students who were in, enrolled in the university without any problem were coming just to practice their Hebrew. Because someone, she was one, one was an immigrant, new immigrant, and they told her that the social work students are talkative. So they can, she can practice her, her Hebrew. So that's where my first uh, relation to Haifa University was a struggle for my place at the uh, student board. And since then, I'm struggling, not for me anymore, but for women's rights and for children's rights. Thank you very much. Hopefully. Yes, I said that these days these things are not happening anymore and we're getting people rightfully, hopefully. So it's a common knowledge that the high education open doors and give opportunities, especially for minority groups. It goes without saying that for Arab women that are double minority group or even triple minority really? group, as you said, I, I, I read your things, so you said a triple minority group, the empowerment potential is great. I, I read an interesting PhD work done by Anat Gilat in uh, 2008, supervised by Professor Rachel Herzlazarovich. It was a mixed method study, and in the qualitative part, Dr. Gilat interviewed Arab, Jewish, Arab and Jewish secular and orthodox students about their experience in the university. Indeed, all of the themes raised were positive. The three major themes that were uh, ordered by, um, you see the scale in a minute. The first one that uh, they meant, the, the women mentioned, the overcoming explicit and implicit objections to the studies. The studies themselves or specific areas that they wanted to study. So there were many objections and obstacles they overcome and they experienced this as an empowerment thing. The second thing is of course gaining self-esteem and self-confidence. But the third one was having high aspirations with intentions and plans to fulfill them. Not only to have the hopes, but indeed to plan how to fulfill them. Some risks were also raised, presented by the young women in the context of objection to the studies. These risks seem to be stronger for the more traditional groups. So I wonder, Nabila, what do you think about such accompanying risks? Do you believe there are any how should they cope with such risks? Of course, I mean, when we're speaking about uh, higher education and obstacles in front of higher education, we have different circles of objections to uh, or obstacles that we face. First, in our internal uh, reality in home at, and in the community, and second, in the, uh, at the academic uh, institution of, as Palestinian inside Israel, you have always the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, problem that you're uh, w working and studying in a language that it's not your language. This is one of, even Arabic is studied by, uh, in Hebrew and in, in uh, the academic universities. So that's, that's one obstacle that we have to be, uh, as, as uh, many Arab students in the beginning in the, of their years, they have to uh, listen, to read, to write in, in Hebrew, which is a second, uh, la second language. Sec and, and we have to uh, practice it as a mother language, which is not a mother language. So we, this is one, one obstacle for many students students and they have to face it and over the years actually I can uh, remember in my uh, first uh, years my grade were 75 in, in general because of the language at the end of the year I the third year my grade were 95 
So the, the fact that I was uh, low in, 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 uh, 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 is, is because of the, the Hebrew. Of course, uh, these are uh, some uh, uh, obstacles that are specific for Arab, Arab students. But of course, also there is the obstacles of, for all women, as, as women, when you have a, a different uh, position. You are a mother, you are a, 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 a most of the students, uh, women students who study for uh, MA and doctorate are uh, with double jobs. They are, in, they are working outside in the, their uh, 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 jobs and they are working at, at home. And because, without a supportive uh, system in the community, Community, it is almost impossible, and uh, we just have a small talk with uh, 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 Summer. Uh, is 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 very very challenging to uh, 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 to fulfill all the duties. And most of our women are uh, trying to be the superwoman. They are trying to be, and this is something that we have our in the, ourselves to uh, uh, deal with. Is not to be super women. You are not super women. So please, please don't look at yourself as a super woman. You don't have to be the best mother, the best housewife, the best housekeeping wife. You can uh, look for support in the community and there is a lot of new possibilities that support the, the woman. So that's the creation of the support system, like nurseries, like kindergarten. This is what's supposed to, do, to be done by the government and in the Palestinian community inside Israel is not done by the government, it has to be done through the civil society and this is something that we in Altafula were uh, advocating for developing of support system so that women can go out for work by developing new nurseries. New nurseries in 1984, the first nursery was opened in Nazareth and by our organization. That until then, there was no nurseries for children. And until today, where there are only 2% of these nurseries are recognized by the government. That is the working woman getting support by the government to, uh, 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 because you can get support, it's, it's, that's the trick in the laws. There are laws, but the implementation of the laws are discriminatory because the, the trick is that you have to receive the funds for your child if, only if he is enrolled in a recognized nursery. Uh, in this in this case, and when only two percent of the existing recognized nurseries are Arab nurseries, then you don't get your support as a working uh, mother, and this is a, a a big a big challenge. So we have to the challenge in front of the Palestinian women side Israel is not only the obstacles in front of the uh, in the society because this is we deal with and most of the uh, student and who wants to achieve something they they uh, on the private and on the collective level we're dealing with is the discriminatory situation that we are uh, facing is big the biggest obstacle in front of the development of the academic that's why i would thank you for the support that you're giving for arab Palestinian women inside Israel, because in this case, you are not supporting the, the, uh, uh, the normal uh, policies that exist in the, in the uh, uh, government. And this is what I always say for the Jewish uh, communities around the world when I to have the uh, possibility to speak. When you support the general supported communities, by the government, you are contributing to the discrimination. So p thank you for not contributing to the discrimination and specifying your support to Palestinian women, which are mostly needed, and I hope for more of such support. Thank you very much. Working? Okay, so during... Uh, it's, it's a bit difficult to speak after Nabila, right? <laughs> She's kind of uh, <laughs> so fascinating. So um, I'll, I'll back, I want to raise another question. During the process of uh, the graduate studies and completion of the thesis, I had the opportunity to see my students grow and empowered. In many cases, I saw young women gaining knowledge, gaining the sense of professional identity, gaining self-confidence. For, for some of them, it was a real transformation. This brings me to another issue of settling back into the community. In cross-cultural 
and immigration literature, a common concept is the cultural shock. Of course, all of you know this concept. And I'm sure that some of the Arab, Arabs in general and Arab women, when they come to the campus, to the Hebrew campus in the university, they feel a kind of a cultural shock. But now, now I want to talk about the um, shock of coming back to your own place. This is the shock of returning. Because after you were exposed to the Western culture of the university, had new norms and new habits, then you have to go back to your own community and then cope with it. So I want to ask you, do you see this other problem? Which are the problems and how do women cope with such as, problems? As someone who studied at Haifa University and then in Jerusalem and then I was thrown from my job for three times and that's why I went to Germany and studied in Germany psychology and came back in 1987 as a clinical psychologist. I'm uh, out and in in cultures and within a different culture. What is, what of course the, uh, the first meeting with, with the other uh, was at, at the Haifa University and uh, the amount of uh, uh, um, uh, prejudice that, that were uh, about, and they are still, I think, one of the uh, problems that we have inside Israel is the segregation and segregation of, of communities, segregation of education, segregation of all, on all levels. One, one of the uh, uh, issues, the second issue is that the de demonization the demonization of the Palestinian, we are looked at the enemy as the fifth column, as the, uh, the one who ought to suspect the, if I'm going with you in the airport together to a joint uh, trip to Germany, we, I will be checked, you will be not checked, I will be truly checked and received a VIP, uh, 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 very important person uh, uh, relation and you will be uh, passing, uh, uh, celebrated uh, by, the, by, by, by them. So, one, and the, the uh, dehumanization, the third issue is the dehumanization. And dehumanization has to cre create stereotypes and it, cre it create superstitions and it create uh, 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 bad, bad images about the Palestinian inside Israel. And this is we see every day and we see it today and yesterday we have a strike, general strike, because of the killing of a person that was demonstrating, participating in a peaceful demonstration in Kufur Qasim against the violence in the village, and this is what, what's happened. So the cultural uh, shock, the shock is, it is, it is doubled, and it's not about only cultural, it's political. It's identity question. You and your identity, you have to negate negate your identity as Palestinian. You have not to be connected to your identity and ask to be someone else, some, the, the, uh, the, the good Arabs, or I don't know what, what, uh, what uh, request, your, your re request the, the uh, system is requesting, is a very, very challenging uh, question, and you have to, to fight, fight back for, for that. But of course, the main issue, I think, that uh, contribute to uh, deal with culture shock is our identity and our uh, belief in ourselves. And this is what I learned over years of working together between Arabs and Jews, and I'm active in that, in that uh, for I was active in, in a different uh, uh, coexistence. We're still uh, dealing with the coexistence. We're shared society today. We're speaking about shared society and we're developing some uh, concept of shared society. And shared society is based on realizing the identity. And you're, when I am proud Palestinian, I can sit here and speak to you with, my, with this uh, pride. In a, in a culture, in any cul given culture, if you respect the others, and you respect the values of the other, and you respect the identity of the others, then you don't, you, you, the, the fear of being uh, recognizing the, the, the Palestinian identity as part, 20% of the, of the citizens of Israel are Palestinian. They are Arabs, they are, but Arab is a big concept. It is Libyan, it's Moroccan, it's Tunisian. They are Palestinian, and we have to recognize that. And we, as Palestinians, we have to be proud of our own identity and to bring this identity and actually to deal with it critically. And this is what, when I believe in, when, when I'm confident in what I am, I can change. I can 
uh, uh, develop. I can criticize my own uh, uh, values. I can criticize some of the habits that we have, and I believe in, in a process that we uh, that uh, uh, I already 40 years working with with the community. The major issue is to believe in ourselves, and for the students here around. Uh, I mean, believe in yourself. What we learn at the university is only a beginning for developing your own uh, 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 tools to uh, your devel academic development. And be without believing in your identity and in yourself, you wouldn't be able to uh, relate to others on an equal level. So we have to uh, strengthen and this is maybe for the university, is to strengthen and to allow and to, to uh, encourage and to empower the uh, student to deal with their own roots and with their own identity so that they can take responsibility. And one thing that I learned from Germany, uh, Mrs. Sonia, one thing that I learned from Germany, as a Palestinian coming to Germany in 1980, I was the terrorist in Germany bec because I'm Palestinian. And I realized that the, uh, most of the people who had the small Nazi within themselves, many people who were celebrating being, me being a Palestinian, thinking that if I am Palestinian, I would be anti-Jewish too, and opening their hearts to, to, to see. The learning that I have, that the people who have dealt with the history took responsibility for the history, not for the past, but for the future. These are the, the people that are acting today upon racism in, in, in Germany and stopping racism in Germany. So that's why we need mostly to learn that we have to open the history, to talk about the history, to talk about the narrative, to take responsibility to what's happened in 48, and without that, we can't build a real future here in the land. Thank you. Now, I hope that some of the programs that you are having here are doing just that, kind of uh, making uh, connections and coexistence. And uh, I want to go to the optimistic side and tell you a small this story. Most, this is the most optimistic. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I believe that this is possible. That's why it is yeah, optimistic. Yeah. From, from this way, it is optimistic. But as you see the situation here and as you, as you ex described your experience here, with the discrimination and so on and so forth. I'm sure that these days people still feel some discriminations, but for this point, I have an optimistic story for you. I'm, I'm a teacher at the um, psychology department. I'm teaching at the social uh, psychology program for the masters. And uh, we happen to have a very heterogeneous group. We have three Arab students, two ultra-Orthodox, actually four Arab students, two ultra-Orthodox, and other uh, regular, or let's say, uh, Jewish people from different uh, origins. And actually, we had a um, Purim party organized by the Arab girls, and they all had costumes, and the uh, two Arab girls were dressed as the ultra-Orthodox ones. They took their hats and things, and they kind of uh, came as an ultra-Orthodox, and there was a very harmonious event. So uh, it could be. It could be happen, and I hope it will be happening a lot. So can you give us a word, Nabila, about the coming back to the community after the experience of the university and how people can make more of their higher education when they come back to the community? Uh, when I came back to, to, uh, from, the Ger from Germany, I came in 1987, in, uh, back in the 8th of March. I chose to have the 8th of March as the Women's Day for coming back because I want to step in a positive, uh, in the, my uh, right uh, uh, side. And uh, um, first of all, uh, I, I am clinical psychologist. I was educated as a clinical psychologist in Germany. I was educated social worker. So I was looking for a job. And someone asked me to teach psychology, developmental psychology for uh, caregivers who are learning to be caregivers in, in the uh, 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 one organization in ACO, and I began teaching psychology and discovered a whole new field, which was 
empty almost, Charles, nothing is, I mean, I wanted a textbook, I wanted a, uh, uh, an article about early childhood in Arabic, I didn't find. So I have to, uh, uh, to develop it from the very beginning. So I began developing the uh, textbooks, began to develop uh, 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 written material about early childhood. And uh, in fact, the first, the first coming, when I came back, I uh, uh, chose to be in Haifa. In, in, uh, uh, I lived in Haifa for a while. I was working in Akko. And then I, I asked myself, uh, why not in Nazareth? Because I'm, uh, after two years from uh, being in, in Haifa, I stepped to Haifa to the Hadar community, which is a mixed community. I stepped beside an Arab-Jewish coexistence program called uh, Musharaki at that time, Shutfut, and I became, be, uh, the Shutfut was be below me, one, one uh, uh, floor below, and I became to be uh, active in Shutfut and the chairperson of Shutfut for years, uh, in, in, and also the Woman to Woman Center in, in uh, Haifa, the Feminist Woman to Woman Center, uh, a street be above me. So I was in a very, uh, 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 in the acti for activism, for my activism, I had all the answers in, in Haifa. But I also stepped in 1987. 1987 was the first intifada. So the, the and we have the intifada brought with, with itself for the peace movement inside Israel a lot of hope, a lot of uh, 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 involvement. So I began to become, became to be very, very active in the peace movement inside Haifa and in the national wide women movement, peace movement, coalition for women in peace, women in black, and, and so on. So when I came back, when I decided to come back physically, I came back already as a work at establishing the center of Altofula Center. So, and I, as an activist, I was uh, uh, known as, as an activist, and, in, in, uh, uh, and uh, it is a challenge for, for a, someone who have been uh, several, one of the challenges why I, I moved to Haifa was I was seven years in Germany. And when I came home, my mother was asking, when are you coming back? Where are you coming back? You, you just tell me, don't, just tell me so that I'll be uh, uh, waiting for you. Why do you need to be waiting for me? Seven years, you don't know whom, with whom I'm, I'm sleeping, where I'm at, where I am. Uh, and now you are asking for, for me to. So I decided to go and, and live uh, alone. And after a while, after getting the uh, uh, recognition from the community, from, the, uh, from my work, my work, creating my work has created a lot of trust, a lot of, and my activism, work and activism has created this, this uh, secure environment to, uh, to be accepted as, as, uh, uh, as I am. And um, I came back and I, I'm, I'm living in the community. I'm living alone and uh, this is something in the community is not at that time, wasn't accepted, but they uh, got to, uh, 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 they, uh, I didn't wait for permission. <laughs> I created a new situation for me and other women so that they can be uh, independent, they can be active, they can be, and I'm seeing it around me, a lot of change is happening in our community. So, and in that positive uh, uh, um, uh, development, and a lot of the new development is happening, a lot of new uh, and achievements are happening, but we still have big, big challenge. That's why we need you. We need you, every one of you, sitting here and working on your academic development. We need you in the community, so come back and don't afraid to give yourself your abilities, your, and you are. You are. I looked at the 14 of this year, and it is an ama amazing group of women. You are welcome to come to the community. And please take responsibility. Take responsibility for our challenges, because without you, without your abilities, we will manage, but will take more time. So, thank you. Thank you very much.